This is what the terrarium looked like a thousand days ago, I haven't opened it since. And this is what it looks like today. Now sit back and relax, because you're about to watch a video about a jar of dirt. Hey, you clicked on it, this is on you. I'm also gonna show how I built the terrarium. And I'm also going to explain how it's possible that plants and animals can survive in a sealed jar for over a thousand days. But first, we gotta go back to day one. What you see here is an idiot thinking he's doing an awesome job filming a jar he just made. Luckily for all of us, 200 days later, I was already a lot better at filming. Just kidding, still an idiot. I lost a lot of footage of the jar, that is why there is a time skip of 200 days. And as you can see, the plants have grown a lot. There was also a slug in the jar back then, but I haven't seen that one in a long time. On day 365, I thought it was a great idea to walk backwards while filming. Turns out, it wasn't. But on day 1000, I found a secret formula of filming jars. Walking sideways. If you think this just turned into a jar full of grass, you would be completely... Um, yeah, you would be kinda right. But there is much more to it than that, I promise. Because here is another plant. Whoa. If you look closely here, you could see some animals moving, but I'll show those later. First, we need to take a look at some goo, and I know you guys would love a close-up of that. You're very welcome. These are algae mixed with water, and they give this part of the jar a swamp-like appearance. As for the most important plant in this jar, of course it's moss, because as they say, once you add moss, you are the biggest boss. Yeah, no one says that. Now to see the animals, we need to go to the dark side. That was uh, that was way too dramatic. This is just the other side of the jar. And in this shot, you can see about 100 animals. These are springtails. They actually aren't considered insects anymore. They have no wings, unlike most insects. And they have internal mouth parts. They help keep this terrarium healthy by decomposing organic matter. They occupy the more humid parts of the jar. Like this one here, that is eating some of the algae. I have been serious for way too long now, so... There used to be a lot more animals in this jar. You can see that from these remnants of tunnels that used to be occupied by isopods like this. And millipedes like this one. They might still be in there, but I haven't seen them in a while. The tunnels are now occupied by springtails. But when I was filming this part, I saw another animal. This is a nematode which is a species of roundworm. They're called that way because they are round and a worm. Oh, never mind, it's cat hair. But I did find the culprit. I feel like there's a dirty joke in here somewhere, but I'm not gonna make it. Now don't click off, for the people that want a jar full of grass, goo and uh, springtails themselves, I'm gonna show you how I built it. And then I'm going to explain how it survived so long without opening it. Go to a dense, ancient forest to collect materials. Last time I said that, people thought I was serious. And I was. This is obviously a real, dense and ancient forest. What is sarcasm? At this point I'm just taking half the forest with me. Including soil that contains a lot of beneficial bacteria and animals. Leaf litter will be food for the decomposers. However, I'm not taking that white stuff. Why stuff is never good, although, no, no it's never good. These are gametophytes, which simply said are baby moss. And this is a rock, which simply said is a rock. Of course we need some wood too. I don't know what species this is, but as a biologist, I'm pretty sure it's a plant. Yep, that's a plant. This is another plant, and as a biologist I can tell you, it's green. Never take too much moss from one spot, so other people can still film themselves collecting moss. And now it's time for the build. First I put a layer of pebbles. This will act as a reservoir for excess water. Next is a layer of crushed charcoal. This will filter the water that runs past it. Just don't throw a whole barbecue in there, like I'm doing here. Next comes the soil we collected. In here are a lot of animals and microorganisms. Make sure to pet the soil, so it feels welcome. Next comes the landscaping. 
Yes, that is indeed escaped land. But we're not done yet. Another piece of wood, and then it's time to add the moss. All this footage is taken from my first video ever on YouTube, by the way. This was even from before I was doing voiceovers. So if you're tired listening to my very expressive voice, full of emotions, you can watch that video without it. I'm adding the plants here. I was so proud of that sliding effect back then. Yeah, I still am. Almost done with the moss. The sticks and leaves are used to give it a more natural look. And they will be used by some of the animals as food. I think everyone can see that that thing will be dead within a week. Oh well. Time for the finishing touches. Ah yes, that one small stick will make a big difference. But keep watching. I'm going to explain how it's possible that it's still alive after a thousand days. This is basically a tiny ecosystem, like outside. Ecosystems have one key factor. Plastic. I'm kidding. People, please stop throwing your shit in nature. The key factor is light. Without light, this jar would be dead within a week. Plants use light to grow and produce oxygen. Like in this broke man time lapse here. I was trying to grow bell peppers in a jar. Needless to say, it failed. Back to our ecosystem. So plants use light to produce oxygen and grow. That oxygen is used by all animals. And herbivores eat the plants. Caterpillars aren't great animals for terrariums. Because they are often very picky of their food. But isopods definitely are not. Also millipedes like this one are great for terrariums. They will eat the wood and decomposing plants. At least 5% of the time. The other 95% of their time, they're too busy banging. Slugs and snails are also good terrarium animals. That a-hole that is poking it is not part of the ecosystem. Oh wait, that's me, never mind. So these herbivores eat the plant and shit them back out. The poop can be broken down further by other organisms. This way, the nutrients become available again for the plants. But of course, we need something to eat the herbivores, like Bob, the spider here. Otherwise, the herbivores would eat all the plants and nothing would be left. Close up of an eating spider incoming. Side note, Bob molted by the way. She grew a little. Doesn't she look pretty? She's even waving at you. Yeah, she's so friendly. But a spider is not the only predator that can be in a terrarium. A mantis, like Bob here, is also a great predator. Or ants, like Bob here, are also great predators. Maybe, uh, maybe I should stop calling my animals Bob. This is getting confusing. With all this activity, these animals produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And the plants need this for their photosynthesis to produce oxygen and grow. No, spiders, mantises and ants aren't great predators for a closed terrarium. But a small centipede like this is. Now I think most people know that plants need water. Within a jar, there is also kind of rain. The water evaporates, condensates against the glass and then drips down again, kinda like rain. Now fair warning, not a lot of animals can survive in a closed jar. Only small animals, like these snails, isopods and springtails can survive in there. Besides that, you can also add a cat. Because if it fits, it sits. Now don't click off yet, please go click on the video in the end screen. It will help me a lot. First, I want to quickly thank everyone that watched and all patrons. Thank you, every new patron gets a spirit animal. And now I think you'll like this video next.